Oh. All right, everyone. Good morning, and uh, thank you for joining us today at uh, our very first, uh, very, very large CMSS virtual spring meeting. As of yesterday, we had over 550 meeting registrants. Uh, so this may be an interesting model for us looking forward, and uh, we're delighted to have you with us today. Uh, we're going to walk through a couple slides, and then I'm going to uh, introduce our keynote, uh, Dr. Ashish Jha. So, uh, Julius, go to the next slide, please. So just a reminder, thanks to all of you, these are our 45 member specialty societies uh, spanning the entire spectrum of uh, age population, disease entities, uh, specialties. So delighted to have so many of you with us today um, and so many of your staffs joining us uh, for the afternoon sessions as well. Next slide. Uh, we want to just remind you of our uh, mission and vision here. We really are trying to, particularly in this difficult time, uh, be indispensable to specialty societies in the medical profession. And I think in particular, this first part of our mission statement uh, is uh, critically important right now, which is uh, supporting and strengthening specialty societies to meet future challenges, thinking about how we can catalyze improvement through our convening and efforts like this, um, as well as really thinking about how we can provide a proactive platform to help assess what are some of the emerging and critical issues um, like this current pandemic that affect healthcare and all the patients that we serve. Next, Julia. So briefly, just wanna thank our partners who uh, have continued to give us support in, uh, in the absence of an in-person meeting, and so many of them are critical to many of our society's efforts around uh, COVID-19 and clinical registries, uh, which we'll have a session about this afternoon. Next slide. Uh, so just quickly, just to give you a quick uh, thumbnail on our agenda for today, after our uh, time with uh, Dr. Jaw this morning, we'll have a quick break and then you'll move into your time of your uh, PPG professional peer group sessions. So we'll have the CEO council. We've given you a good break for lunch um, and then we'll return back for the two uh, successive uh, uh, workshops, uh, all of which are COVID-19 related. Um, and then a short break between them. And then at the end of the day, we'll, uh, in each of the Zoom sessions, just do a brief closing remarks. And at that point, remind you to please do the evaluation that we'll email you at the end of the day. It's really important for us to understand if this virtual format works, how we can make it better, and uh, where we go from here. So next slide. Uh, here are some tips uh, we put forward, and we'll uh, keep sharing these with you as much as possible. Try to keep yourself on mute. Um, and uh, I believe all of you got these as well. The plan for uh, Q&A after uh, Ashish's address will be that um, we'll be looking through the chat box, find uh, questions that we think we'll have time to answer, and then um, we'll ask to, we'll call on you and ask you to unmute yourself since with this many people, we can't sort of find your picture easily. Um, we'll then call on you to ask the question for Ashish. So uh, Ashish has been gracious enough to uh, leave a significant portion of time for Q&A, which we're thrilled with. I think with that, the next slide is to uh, introduce Ashish, who for many of you who watch television and many of us do more than we ever had during this pandemic, uh, he has been ubiquitous on most of the TV uh, channels. Uh, for the last uh, couple of months, and thank you for your leadership there, Ashish, of trying to keep science, data, and evidence front and center. Um, I've actually known Ashish, I think, since you were a medical student, uh, when he was a fellow at the, he was a research fellow at the program with David Bates when I was uh, a fellow as well. So we're delighted that he's here with us today. Uh, many of you know he's a professor of global health at the Harvard Teach School. Uh, Chan School of Public Health and leads the Harvard Global Health Institute. Uh, interestingly, in the midst of all this, he had accepted a new job and by the fall, he will be the new Dean at Brown University's School of Public Health. Um, between now and then, we're looking forward to seeing more and more of him on our television screens. And uh, again, thank you so much for joining us today, Ashish, and I'll turn it over to you. Great, good morning. Uh, thank you, Helen, for that kind introduction. And I'm, I'm actually gonna try to figure out if I can spend less and less time on television screens in the upcoming uh, weeks and months, but we'll, We'll see where it all goes. And, and good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me um, join you this morning uh, to get this really important day kicked off. And you know, when I think about where we are as a, a country and people talk about the economy and, and the outbreak, one of the lines that Justin Wolfers, who's a great economist, uh, argues is, you know, if you want to deal with the economy, deal with the virus. And in many ways, when we think about all the implications of where the healthcare system, how badly it's been damaged by this outbreak, 
um, a lot of what will happen to the healthcare system over the upcoming months and let's say year, 18 months, will really depend on how we as a society deal with the virus. And so what I'm gonna to try to do for the next 20 minutes, and I really only wanna speak for about 20, 25 minutes, is lay out where we are in the pandemic. Um, and a little bit of history, and I suspect most of you know most of it. I'm gonna to try to address a couple of things that keep popping up as controversial issues, um, because I think it's worth just understanding where the science is on it. And then I'll get into the most dangerous business of all, which is I'll prognosticate where this is all going uh, over the next couple of months, over the next six months, over the next year. Uh, and it's, of course, dangerous because who actually really knows? There's been so many surprises, but I'll try to give you my best assessment. And then I'll finish off by coming back to what it means for us. So I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm a practicing internist. I'm a hospitalist. I work at the West Roxbury VA. Um, I've been thinking a lot about what is it going to mean for clinical practice? How are hospitals going to change? How, are, how is policy going to change? And again, I'll, I'll do a little speculating, and I suspect uh, we'll get into a lot of that in the, in the Q&A. So that's my agenda, uh, no slides, and my, uh, so let's sort of start with where we are on this pandemic. Um, we're sort of month four, month five, actually May 1st, uh, we're month five, month six of this pandemic. Um, the way to think about it is the pandemic began sometime in early to mid-November. Um, that's when we think the, uh, the jump of the virus from a bat to a human uh, happened. And the virus started circulating in Wuhan, in the Hubei province. And I suspect by mid to late December, it was not only out in large, in many, many parts of China, but it was out in large parts of the world. Um, and I suspect, and I don't know for sure, that we might have had some cases in the US as early as December, but I'm very confident we had some cases in the US as early as early January, so well before uh, what we know. Um, and it's just obviously at that time, we weren't testing people, um, we weren't uh, looking for it. Um, WHO was notified of this outbreak on December 31st. And what, is, what happened in January is really remarkable. Um, the world, I think, actually acted very, very quickly. And there's been a lot of questions about, did we delay response? Um, but what happened was we very quickly identified the virus. We sequenced it. We developed a diagnostic test for it. And by end of January, uh, much of the world knew about the virus, knew its sequence, knew how to test for it, and uh, knew that it was spreading globally. A um, couple of quick things, then I really will focus on the U.S. Um, I see the outbreak, the kind of epicenter of the outbreak being China in January, East Asia in early to mid-February, Western Europe late February into early March, and then for the last six weeks, the global epicenter has been us. And right now we're at about three and a half million identified cases, a third of which are in the United States. Uh, I, I am happy if people wanna come back to like, what do we know about China and the data from China? And I do find the data from China somewhat unreliable, but if we take it at face value with all the challenges that that has, um, America is about a third of all the cases in the world. What I suspect is likely to happen over the next month or six weeks is our, hopefully if we maintain reasonably good policies, the number of cases in the US will decline and we'll get into June, July with relatively smaller number of cases. And the epicenter is going to move uh, to large parts of the, of the world like India, like Africa, um, like Latin America. And those places are already starting to see surges. And that is important for two reasons. One is it's important unto itself, right? If hundreds of millions of people, billions of people uh, are now kind of in, in harm's way and, and susceptible and you've seen lots and lots of infections. We're gonna see a lot of suffering and a lot of death. And these countries are gonna have a very hard time managing it. Social distancing is both very costly and very hard in these places. And kind of a, a massive testing, tracing, isolation strategy is also very, very hard to pull off in, in a lot of these places. And, and obviously a lot of countries have health systems that are very ill-equipped to take care of critically ill people. So I think we're gonna see a lot of suffering in a lot of places outside of the US. And we need to think about what our global health strategy is. The second part is those places will be uh, in some ways hotbeds for infections for the rest of the world because people in these places don't stay in these places and there will be travel and they will become sources of infection back to Europe, back to the United States. And so whether we think about and care about what's happening globally because it's the right thing to do and we ought to, or we're just being kind of very self-centered uh, and motivated, 
either way, we have to care about what's happening in the rest of the world. And I think that's very important. And I worry that in the upcoming months, we're not going to do enough of that. So let's talk a little bit about where we are with the outbreak in the United States. Um, as I said, you know, we're uh, about a third of all the cases. We have more than a million cases in the U.S. Uh, more than uh, 60,000 people have died. Um, both of those are dramatic underestimates. So let's actually talk about that. Um, we think, so one of the big questions has been, how many people have actually been infected? And you've all heard about the serologic studies, and I'm happy to get into the serologic studies and what they're teaching us. But the numbers that I carry around in my head is that I look at the number of people we've actually identified, and I think the true number is 10 to 20 times that. Uh, it's not 100 times that. And there are important implications for, is it 10 to 20? So if there are a million Americans who have been identified as having been infected, I suspect the true number is 10 million, 15 million, maybe 20 million, but not 60 million. And that has implications for how much immunity there is in the community, how close are we to herd immunity, uh, all of that. And, uh, and I just, I don't, haven't seen any data that I believe that says that we're at 60 or 100 times the, the real numbers. On the death, there is more and more evidence that we have been vastly undercounting death, that a lot of people have been dying in the last uh, six weeks, two months. Uh, and, and here's the tricky part. A lot of people have been dying, I think because of COVID that we haven't identified. And then a lot of people have been dying because our healthcare system has been uh, so, and, and in different parts in different ways, it's in so battered in places where the outbreaks have been large. And then so affected in places where the outbreaks haven't been large, but we canceled elective surgeries. We uh, canceled access to care in lots of important ways. And so there have been these massive spillover effects on uh, chronically ill people who need the healthcare system. They actually need it to survive. They need it to stay well. Um, it turns out that what we do actually matters. And we haven't been able to do it in a way that, uh, that we feel is ideal. And I think there are a lot of, there's been a lot of suffering from that. Um, where we are on the epidemic in the US is we have now flattened the curve. Flattened the curve is not the same thing as crushed or, or brought the number of cases way down. If you think about it, it we, we kind of climbed up a mountain and now we're on a plateau. We're still pretty high up. Um, we are identifying about 25, 30,000 cases a day. Um, but we all believe, people who are paying attention to this, that we're only capturing maybe 10 to 20 percent of all the cases out there. Uh, so when we say we identified 30,000 people with COVID yesterday, there probably were 150,000 new cases of COVID yesterday. Uh, we just missed 80 percent of them or 90 percent of them. That's still a very large burden of cases. And, um, and we're pretty flat on that. And, uh, and the only way that we know how to bring that down, there are two ways that we know how to bring that, that curve down. One is social distancing. The other is testing, tracing, and isolation. And at the risk of being simplistic uh, to all of you who are very sophisticated and understand this, let me just make one important point with, about this issue of testing, and then I'll get into testing. Um, is the entire strategy of dealing with a pandemic, with dealing with any outbreak, is keeping infected people away from susceptible people, right? When you don't have immunity, you don't have a vaccine, um, the entire strategy is we gotta keep infected people away from susceptible people. And when you don't have a good way to do that, what you do is you shut the economy down, you shut activity down, and that keeps infected people away from, uh, from susceptible people. It keeps everybody away from everybody. Um, when we go back to having economic activity, even in more limited forms, we're gonna start having infected people in, engage with susceptible people the R naught is going to go up, the number of infections are going to go up, and we're going to see a bigger and bigger outbreak. Um, the only way out of that is to identify who's infected and isolate just them. So I always sort of say that the testing, tracing, isolation is shelter in place just for the infected people. That's what we want. And we want everybody who's not infected, who's susceptible but not infected, uh, to go about their daily business. And the only way I know how to do that is through massive amounts of testing. That's what allows us to identify who's infected and who's not. And we have sort of serious limitations and problems with testing in our country. Um, and we're doing about 200,000 or so tests a day right now. And again, everything when I say about testing, I mean testing for the virus. I'm not talking about serologic testing. And again, I, I will come back to serologic testing. So where we are is in some ways, we're kind of at a little bit of a stalemate with the virus. We have brought it under control but we have not really brought the number of infections down in a substantial way. 
there are some states where the number of infections are very, very low. Montana, Wyoming, Alaska. Um, there are some places where the, the number of new infections is falling, New York and New Jersey, actually. But there are a large number of states where the number of infections is pretty stable or actually rising. Georgia, Colorado, uh, Florida is pretty stable. So we have this very funny mix of where the epidemic is in the country with different states being in very, very different places. And that'll have really important policy implications for as we go through the next few weeks and months. So May 1st today is the day that the president officially said that the federal recommendations on distancing uh, expire. And we can all go back to our daily business. But here we are on a Zoom call because none of us are actually convinced that today we can go back on our, about our daily business. And we can't, not in most places. Uh, and that's because the number of infections is still quite high, new infections, uh, because the testing is still inadequate, uh, and our healthcare systems are not fully recovered. So what I suspect is going to happen over May is you're going to see different states take different tactics in terms of opening up. And uh, the president's plan on reopening uh, America again is actually a, quite a good plan. It's got some very specific and important problems, but the framework is right. And one of the things I've said is that it has the fingerprints of Debbie Burks and Tony Fauci all over it. Uh, you can see that they really did help craft that approach. And what it is, is a very gated approach that says states should begin to open up their economy. Um, after a sustained period, 14 days, of dropping cases, not flat, dropping number of cases, in the context of states having plenty of t testing capacity and a tracing and isolation program in place. Uh, and then a healthcare system that's in reasonably good shape to manage surges if they were to occur. That's, those are the three criteria. They're the right criteria. Um, there's a lot of specifics that are challenging there. And what I'm seeing is a lot of states going ahead and opening up without really meeting those criteria. So not meeting the criteria that the president's task force has laid out. Um, and that worries me immensely about what's going to happen over the upcoming weeks and months. Now, I'm going to move towards talking about what, what the summer looks like, what the fall looks like, and then when this all hopefully comes to an end. Um, I am in the minority among people who've been paying close attention to this who believe that the summer months are actually gonna be pretty good, that there's gonna be a pretty substantial seasonal effect. Um, most experts believe that the seasonality issue is gonna be mild, there's gonna be a kind of a very small effect, and that we'll continue to see large outbreaks in lots of places around the country. Um, and why, and the evidence behind what I'm arguing for is not stellar. It's not like I've got great evidence and those experts are wrong. In fact, vast majority of experts disagree with what I'm about to say. So you should know that um, because you should take what I'm about to say with a large grain of salt. When I look at how the outbreaks have gone in, in New Orleans, in, in Florida, um, when you go back to China and look at places that were warmer and more humid versus places that were less so, I think there is enough evidence to, to hope for a, a, a decent sized seasonal effect. And that with maintaining social distancing, ramping up testing, I'm hopeful that we will have a pretty decent summer. What does that mean? There will not be any baseball games, or there should not be any baseball games, or certainly not ones that you and I attend. So I will not be going to Fenway Park this summer. Um, and there's a whole debate about, can you have baseball games with no fans? And is that going to be safe? And different issue. So large gatherings are out. Um, crowded bars are not going to be uh, acceptable. But can you go out and have a cup of coffee with a friend uh, with some amount of distancing in a in a Dunkin Donuts or Starbucks or could get a glass of wine with a friend at a bar where it's not super crowded? I think so. Uh, so I think that kind of a summer is gonna be much more plausible in most places in the country. Um, restaurants will operate at, I don't know, 50% capacity. Uh, you can imagine lots of things like that. Of course, my kids are, they have one question, which is summer camps. And for me, summer camps are possible if we have really good testing because I'm pretty comfortable with the idea that kids go and maybe somebody will be infected and they infect each other. But we need to know is that before they come home to their parents or grandparents uh, that they are not infected. And so we're gonna have to have a decent amount of testing capacity. Um, so the summer should be okay. Uh, the fall is where I think we are going to get into a lot of trouble. Um, so the, if, if seasonality, if I'm right on seasonality, 
then the, the gift that gives us benefits in the summer is going to crush us in the fall. And unfortunately, what's going to happen is it's going to coincide with the flu season. And so we are going to, we already get strained every year with the flu season. We've just figured out a, you know, we, our health system is pretty resilient and we've figured out how to manage flu seasons. But we all know that in December and January, uh, the hospitals get pretty full. Um, and then if you throw in a big surge of COVID on top of that, we're going to have a lot of challenges uh, into the fall. And, uh, and what that means to me is we need to prepare very heavily for the fall and really think about capacity, really think about what it means to deliver care in, in, in the context of a surge. And of course, because I've been a little obsessed with testing, I'm really think about what is an aggressive testing, tracing and isolation strategy that allows us to keep our economy and our society reasonably open in the fall. Um, most experts I talk to, my, most of my colleagues think we're gonna be shut for a large chunk of the fall. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm not, again, so pessimistic. I think we can stay, keep our economy largely open. Maybe some places will have to shut for, for periods of time. But to me, this is really about uh, preparation, getting ready, uh, and doing a whole bunch of things to, to get ready. Last couple of last points, and then I will stop because I'd like to get into questions. Um, when does this all come to an end? It all comes to an end when we have a vaccine. And uh, your guess on vaccine is as good as mine. I've been tracking this very closely. There are, there are eight vaccines right now in clinical trials with I think like another 90 uh, in preclinical going into clinical trials. We are gonna have like potentially up to 100 vaccine uh, candidates. And, um, you know, if you're there, and there are enough pessimists who say, well, we've never built a coronavirus vaccine that has worked before. Uh, we don't really understand immunity of this virus. Uh, that's all true. Um, but the way I look at it is we're going to take 100 shots on goal. Um, even if we're standing somewhat far away from the goal, I'm pretty confident uh, one or two of those are going to go in and we only need one or two. Uh, the two furthest along, there's one from the Oxford group and there's one in China. And, and uh, either one of them could end up working out. They both have done very well on, uh, on monkeys and, 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 and elicited an immune response in monkeys that then when those monkeys were uh, exposed to large amounts of virus, uh, they didn't get infected. Um, we also know that humans are not monkeys, and there are things that work in, in uh, non-human primates that don't end up working in human primates. So we'll have to see uh, what happens with vaccines. But I am on the optimistic side of, of um, on the vaccine stuff. I don't think we're going to have one in September, um, which was essentially implied in that New York Times article. Um, I can imagine healthcare workers maybe being among the first group that starts getting them in the mid to late fall if everything goes super smoothly. And again, just like big fingers crossed. Uh, and then maybe a broader into the, into the uh, broader American community uh, in the spring of 2021. And if everything goes well, and if most people get a reasonable immune response and we can get to high enough numbers, uh, we're gonna be in much, much better shape uh, once that vaccine is out and, and, and widely delivered. So I am, as I said, I am optimistic uh, but boy, this stuff is obviously uh, hard to predict. A um, couple of other just quick points, and then I, I will stop. Um, one is around therapy. So uh, remdesivir. I'm, you know, again, I haven't seen, we haven't seen the data from the NIAID trial, but, uh, and I know there's some concerns about changing the, the primary outcome was changed in, the, in two weeks before. I am not so concerned about that. Uh, again, I'm happy to have a conversation about that if people want to, but I am optimistic about this and I feel like uh, it'll end up being an important part of our uh, therapeutic armamentarium. Um, I think something else that I'm very optimistic about, but optimistic is not the same thing as I have scientific evidence, um, but it's something else I'm optimistic about uh, is not hydroxychloroquine, uh, where I think the evidence is, is not so good, uh, but I am more optimistic about convalescent plasma, uh, maybe monoclonal antibodies against the uh, the subunit of the uh, spike protein that people are working on and developing, uh, I, I think it's a much better than even chance that that'll end up being a, an important therapy. Um, but again, I, I'm basing it on literally a case series. And so please take uh, everything I'm saying with a, with a big grain of salt because we, we don't have the evidence that we would all want. Um, but that's being, that's being worked on and being generated. And I think in the next couple of months, we'll have a lot more evidence and, and that'll be helpful. Last point I want to finish with is around the healthcare system. Um, a lot of folks have brought up, and rightly so, that the way we de dealt with the COVID surge in late March and all of April of shutting down elective stuff, 
uh, opening up new capacity, um, going virtual, um, has been enormously costly to everybody who doesn't have COVID. And they're right. It has been enormously costly. And I don't even know how costly. We're going to have to sort out how many people suffered, how many people died, because the healthcare system uh, wasn't able to take care of them appropriately. And it wasn't necessarily just that we weren't able to do it. It was also the psychological concerns that people have. They didn't want to go to the hospital. And, um, and this is what happens when you have to react very, very quickly to what looks like a tsunami and you have no idea, is this going to be a 50 foot tsunami or a 25 foot tsunami? I mean, you don't know. You do the kinds of things we did in the healthcare system. And I think the healthcare system was marvelous in how it responded. It did an amazing job. But my point is, let's not repeat that again. And so what I think will happen is we're going to see a ramping up of elective surgeries. And I so put elective because a lot of these things that are elective are not so elective. Um, I think we're going to see a ramping up over the summer. And again, if I'm right, that the seasonality issue helps us. But I want us to be much more deliberate about how we're going to deal with the fall. Because if we see a surge of cases of COVID and influenza coinciding at the same time, what I don't want is in late September, early October, kind of a similar panic, and then we're gonna cancel everything again. That, that, that we know is very harmful. Now we're prepared, or at least now we're warned, and we have to be prepared. And so I wanna use the time between now and October. And again, I don't actually know when the next surge is gonna be, no one does. Uh, but I want us to use that time to really think about, maybe we, some things that we would have done in November, maybe we wanna do them in September. Uh, maybe we want to come up with places that are going to be COVID only and other places that are not COVID at all. And because we'll be hopefully better off on testing, we'll be able to continue to doing. It. There's a whole bunch of strategies that, that all of you uh, can come up with uh, better than I can. But I just think we as a, as a health system have to do a better job. And that's not criticism of the way we did it. I don't think there was any way around what we did. Uh, but now, now we know. And now we have more time to plan. Final thought. Um, this is obviously like, you know, it's the pandemic of the century and it has changed everything and it will change everything. And so what's really clear to me, and I suspect all of you, is that a lot of the policy changes that we are make, making to get through the pandemic, the ways that we're thinking about virtual care, the way we're thinking about relaxing certain regulations around safety and uh, quality measurement, I don't think we're going back. Like, I just don't see us going back to pre-COVID in 18 months. Let's say we have a fabulous vaccine. Everybody gets vaccinated. We're basically done with this pandemic. I don't think the next morning CMS wakes up and says, all right, good. Let's go back to January 2020. It's not going to happen. And I don't, obviously, I can't predict all the ways things will change. But I am, the one, one thing I can, I'm very confident of is that things will look very different. Um, and how they look different will be determined will be based in large part on what we as a as a medical community as physician leaders as specialty societies as, as other uh, clinical groups argue what the new reality should be i think we have an opportunity to remake our health system in a way that we probably have never had before it's one of the few silver linings of what has been a uh, a really horrible pandemic and will continue to be something we can struggle with. So I think we want to also use this time to think about what does the post-COVID world look like. Um, I could probably keep going, but let me stop there. Uh, say thank you again for inviting me this morning, and, and I hope we have uh, plenty of time for questions. Dr. Burson. Ah, thank you, Dr. Ja. Virtual clapping. Uh, <laughs> convincing. Uh, thank you so much. That was great. It was actually remarkable. I was watching the I was watching the chat, and as people typed a question, your next sentence usually answered it. So mm -hmm. a, a good number of those questions were uh, answered. But I, I've teed up the first four folks. So uh, first, we're going to turn to uh, Daisy Smith, who actually had several for you answered, and then came back with one you haven't yet answered. So Daisy, do you want to ask your question? Sure. Thanks for a great presentation. Um, I ha just had a question about, have you heard of any innovative ways of coupling our ramping up of testing with uh, influenza vaccination for the fall? It just seems like we need to figure out a way to get a larger proportion since we do have an influenza vaccine. Uh, so just interested if there are any ideas that are floating around about that. Um, no, it's a, it's a great question. Um, what I, so obviously we're gonna all hope and pray that um, we have a good vaccine this year, that it's, that it's pretty effective. And I think 
a lot more people are going to take the influenza vaccine. So, you know, we get like 50, 60% uptake across the country. My guess is we're going to get much, much higher uptake. And if we have a reasonably decent vaccine, we're actually going to do much better on influenza because part of the reason we don't, uh, we still get hit pretty hard is that they're just, we don't get into high enough numbers to get uh, sort of herd immunity from influenza. So, uh, so just as a first order business, um, I think we're going to see very high rates of influenza vaccine uptake in the fall. Second is your idea of trying to couple that with something around COVID, whether it's testing or, uh, or something else, is a really interesting idea that I have not heard. So um, if you have any more thoughts about how, about how that might work, I'm happy to, like, I'd love to sort of engage offline and, and try to think about that with you. Perfect. All right. Turn to Bill Thorworth from uh, Radiology. Bill? Sorry, I took a second to unmute. Um, I, my, my question is, uh, should the healthcare system, which is already, you know, uh, stressed and with lots of uh, reports of burnout, should we be looking to kind of supercharge, you know, with your estimate of uh, decreased COVID over the course of the summer, should we be kind of supercharging facilities and healthcare providers for screening and elective care over the summer? So if the second wave does occur in the fall, uh, we've kind of caught up. And when you say supercharge, just doing a lot more, um, trying to get uh, a lot of backlog done and some of the, some of the pre stuff. Is that what you mean? Correct. In other words, you know, extended extended hours, uh, obviously increase. We've got many um, radiologists. We have many radiologists who've been furloughed over, you know, because the the elective work's been uh, so low over the last couple yeah. of weeks, and it, you know, kind of get every, it kind of all hands on deck type of thing. Yeah. I, yeah, I think, uh, so the, the short answer is yes. I think that sounds like a really smart idea and we should do, we should do that. You can surely appreciate the, the complexity of some of the, of the ways. So we've got a lot of doctors and nurses who are pretty burnt out from, especially in places like New York and Detroit. And so we got a part of it is like, who's going to be the workforce that's going to be willing to work late hours uh, after just having th been through what they went through. So, so one is a kind of working through that, but uh, I think that's solvable. Uh, and then we've got to come up with like, we really have to think about the financial implications because uh, the healthcare system has really been financially quite battered by, um, and especially primary care or ambulatory care, I should say, um, but primary care specifically. So I think there's a bunch of policy stuff, but yeah, I think from a clinical leadership point of view, you're absolutely right. I would like us to do uh, that sort of supercharging in the summer uh, to get us much better prepared for the fall. Great, thanks so much. Uh, next, we'll turn to uh, Saul Levin from Psychiatry. Hi, thank you so much. A great talk. Um, so uh, I just finished my bi-weekly, every other week meeting with my staff. I have about 200 staff that have all been at home now since I think it's March 16th. You know, so it's been a while. And they keep asking me, when am I, when are they coming back to work? And how are we going to do the plan of letting maybe in groups come back to work? Uh, I've just ex told them that they should expect to be at home till the end of uh, May, and then we'll relook at it then. Uh, knowing you're about to take your new position, I have a feeling this is going to be a very common thing you're going to hear from all your university departments. So uh, it's going to become very real to you uh, shortly, you know, in yep. a way that I think all of us are doing. Please tell us what would you be doing now and how do we do it, particularly when you talk about this, this, uh, the spring, you know, uh, the summer and then the fall? And where are you? Uh, Washington, D.C. Got it. Uh, and most of your staff, I'm assuming, is in that, in the D.C. area. In the tri-state the tri yeah. area, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, uh, you know, I was hoping you'd say we're all in Montana. I know you're not. I'm just kidding. But I would say <laughs> it's, uh, this is easy. Um, so um, two thoughts. First of all, um, we want to be in any place, wherever people are, we want to be as data driven as possible about, about kind of opening back up. And so again, the criteria that the, that the President's Task Force has laid out, I think, again, is, is, is approximately right, is you want to see two weeks of, of dropping caseloads. You want to see relatively low numbers of, of new cases. And then you want to be in a place where you have reasonably good testing capacity and then tied to a reasonable tracing and isolation. That's when I've been recommending to governors that, that those are the criteria they should be using. Again, the gov it's not my idea, this is the president's task force. And when that will hit for different places will vary. Um, New York is probably still many, many weeks away from hitting that. Uh, they will see declining cases, but their case load was so high that it's gonna be a while. 
Um, when we come back, life is going to look very different. So it is not, as you're sort of suggesting, Saul, it's not a, we'll open up the doors and we'll go back to January 2020. And so in workplaces, we have to really think about common gathering spots and, and how, changing them, making sure there's actual physical distance between people. I think things like if you can't do that easily, thinking about, you know, maybe half your staff telecommutes on Tuesdays and Thursdays and the other half telecommutes Mondays and Wednesdays. And then on Fridays, people can do whatever they want or, you know what I mean? But like you can imagine policies that really thin out. And so I think we're all going to want to put in policies like that and then see what happens. And if in the next two, three, four weeks, levels of transmission in the community remain low, then you might be able to relax that a bit further. But the general strategy of coming back to work is uh, start when, you, when your state starts, be data driven, and then start slow and go. And I think if you can do that, uh, you have a pretty good shot of, of having your workforce coming back and working throughout the summer. Perfect. All right. Turn to uh, Daryl and I had a question about how we could work together on early warning signs. Uh, Daryl? Thank you for um, your talk, uh, Dr. Ja. Daryl and Moyer from the American College of Physicians. I'm based in Philadelphia. Um, just to first a comment, and that is the contact tracing, unfortunately for this disease, uh, is much different than influenza or other diseases that has such a short um, incubation period. Um, but I, I guess my, my question goes to, I'm an infectious diseases physician, um, and certainly uh, if we had better uh, sentinel surveillance here, uh, we wouldn't sort of be in this boat. The CMSS represents over 800,000 practicing physicians, so a good proportion of docs on the front line. How can, how can CMSS help? Uh, to be part of the early warning system as a group, work together as an organization uh, and or uh, externally uh, to help to leverage that incredible power of our network. Yeah, it's a fabulous question. And I'd love to, uh, I'd love to brainstorm with you about that because um, uh, I completely agree that one of the major challenges is our inability to identify um, cases before. So there, there are two issues, right? Um, one is we need a, a more robust surveillance system uh, than we have. And, and part of the problem here is this is not like influenza in that we have so much asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic spread. And how much is, of course, still up in, up in the air. Um, the numbers I use in my head, and I don't know if these are right, but is probably about 20 to 25 percent of people are, are asymptomatic. Like they just never develop a symptom. Um, but spread. And then another 25% of the spread is from people who are pre-symptomatic. And so um, having ways of identifying pre-symptomatic, I mean, I, basically pre-symptomatic people a little easier because they will develop symptoms. Having a way to develop, uh, to identify asymptomatic people is like the huge complicated question that we don't know the answer to. And a bunch of us have been actually thinking about what, what, what kind of strategies do we need? Um, but frontline clinicians, I think, are I mean, not on the asymptomatic stuff, though there are some ideas on that too. But frontline clinicians are going to have to be a central part of this. And so I don't have a short answer for you, um, but I will say that if we're not engaging frontline clinicians in this process of, of developing uh, a surveillance system, it's not going to work. So um, we should think through what that, what that looks like. But I think our kind of influenza surveillance mechanisms are not going to be enough to get us through the fall. And we do need to really bolster that with a bunch of other, uh, bunch of other tools. Great. Thanks, Ashish. Uh, next, uh, Larry, please, from Hospital Medicine. Uh, thank you, Ashish. And I'm always glad to see when uh, one of our hospitalists is the keynote speaker. We're all over the place. I'm from the Society of Hospital Medicine, representing hospitalists. Uh, uh, CMSS uh, represents organizations that puts on meetings for physicians of hundreds or thousands of physicians. Listening to your talk, uh, are, you are you recommending that we think about not holding these meetings until there's a vaccine or herd immunity, which sounds like it's uh, the middle to the end of 2021? Thanks for, thanks for that uh, nice question, Larry. Just you put me right in the, in the firing line there. 
Uh, I'm going to support whatever Dr. Burstyn thinks is the appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, I'll be honest. And because we are among friends, and I will be honest with you, I would be very nervous about a gathering of 500 physicians. Um, I, I, I don't know how you do that in a way that's appropriately socially distanced. And uh, so, so it's interesting. So the question is, could you pull it off? And the answer is you could pull it off. So imagine we truly have ubiquitous testing. And what you do is you get a gathering. And when people show up, the first thing they need to do is get tested. And you can only attend the meeting if you, if you test negative. And if you can combine serologic testing with, with virus testing, uh, and these are not, this is not um, pie in the sky. Like I think on testing, I think life is gonna look very different in September. We are not gonna be this like insanely constrained uh, testing infrastructure that we have right now. Uh, so if you have that kind of testing, um, then yeah, you could do it. And you, I'd feel pretty comfortable, right? If everybody tests negative, you'd get a bunch of serology as a, to also see who's been previously immune. You've got, you could, you could pull it off. Just going blind, I don't know how, you'd, how we'd all feel comfortable because if you spread it to 100 docs and then they go back to their communities and they take care of patients, it, it's potentially a disaster. And so um, the strategy would have to be very proactive and deliberate. So there's a ton of questions on testing, which we'll come back to, but uh, not surprisingly, since you are the testing guy, but uh, let me turn to Cliff next from ASCO. Cliff, are you with us? To be. Yep. There we go. Thanks. Thanks very much. Cliff Huddis from the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, update. It's really informative and frankly reassuring with regard to many of the decisions that uh, many of us are having to make on a weekly basis right now. Um, I do have a, a very specific question. Uh, ASCO has staff in up to 20 states in several countries. Uh, that means we have our toes in many of the local communities, plural, that are dealing with this. Personally, I'm in New York, and you know that's an epicenter of, of all of this. One of the things we haven't spent much time on, though, is contact tracing and its utility and effectiveness. The mayor, as well as I think the governor, but I think de Blasio said that they're going to hire 1,000 or more people to serve as contact tracers. I will share with you that I have personal one-to-one -one experience with what has happened in Shanghai for family reasons, and I know the intensity and persistence of the contact tracing there. My question is, do you have thoughts about any utility for this in an open society like the United States? And is this going to make any difference or what might we expect? Yeah. So um, I do have thoughts and I, it will make a difference. So let me just now build that in a bit. Um, it, we need contact tracing. The modeling that I have seen so there are people like Paul Romer, former Nobel, you know, not former Nobel laureate, Nobel laureate, uh, economist, brilliant guy, who's arguing for 30 million tests a day, right? Just remember, we're at 200,000. He's arguing for 30 million tests a day, 10% of the American people getting tested every day. Even in that model, which I don't think is impossible, by the way, we could get to 30 million tests a day. Um, it, you, it won't be enough to cur curtail the outbreak. You will need some amount of contact tracing. So the question is, in my mind, isn't, contact tracing or no contact tracing. It's how much contact tracing can we live with? If we have zero contact tracing, we are looking at the next 18 months of being open for two months, being shut for three months, opening for two months, shutting for three months. And to me, that's a little bit of a nightmare. And I would like to figure out how to avoid that. Um, testing is step one of avoiding that scenario. By the way, that scenario of two, three, open, shut, open, shut. That's what people like Mark Lipschitz, who's probably the best ID epidemiologist in the country, is arguing that we're probably going to end up having. Right? So this is not like some doomsday scenario by some random guy. Um, and so the question to me is, how do we avoid that? And testing is a start on that, but testing alone won't do it. Uh, it's testing with tracing and isolation. And I can talk a bit more about how I suspect it's going to need to work. We're going to learn a lot about what, how we do it in, in America. And you're right, Cliff. It's been very aggressively done in China. What I know is even if we do a relatively mediocre job, it'll help. It really will. And so maybe instead of being open for only two months, we'll be, op be able to open for three months and then have to shut down. Not great, but I'll take the extra month, right? If we do it really well, 
I think we have a pretty good shot. So then the question is what is really well and how is America gonna tolerate it, which is really at the heart of your question. So I think, again, the estimates are, are all over the place, but I think we probably need two to 300,000 contact tracers in America. Um, I think it has to look something like, I wake up, let's say tomorrow morning, I have a little fever, a little sore throat, I, get a call, I call in, I get a test, I'm positive. An hour later, a contact tracer calls me and says, okay, Ashish, let's talk about your last five days and goes through it. There, and I'm, I have, I'm ignoring technology for a second, which I'll come to in a second. Um, but they sit with me for two hours, three hours on the phone and walk me through everything I've done. You can start seeing all the challenges of this. Uh, they get the names of everybody. They get the numbers of as many people as possible. And the, the standard that contact tracers are using right now is you have to have been within six feet of somebody for 10 minutes or longer. So if you happen to walk by a grocery clerk, unless you gave them a hug, and we should all avoid hugging as, as much as grocery clerks are great people, no hugging for a while. Um, you know, assuming we didn't do that, probably okay. You don't have to go find the grocery clerk. Um, but but th using that rule, identify everybody and then call all those people and get them all tested and be very persistent about calling all those people. And if they don't call you back, call them, call them, call them. And then there are important questions like, do you threaten them? Like if you don't call back, we're gonna have the state troopers come. That's a, that's a policy question. It makes me really anxious to get the police involved. And my general inclination is no. We'll miss a few, but I'd rather not turn this into a, 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 a law enforcement thing. If we do that kind of aggressive strategy, and then here's the supplement on technology. Um, I think pure technology-based contact tracing is not gonna work in the United States. But if you supplement everything I just described with a technology app that's in your phone that Apple or, or Android put in, and it helps augment, oh, I missed that guy. Oh yeah, Helen and I hung out and had coffee. I forgot about that, which I would never forget hanging out and having coffee with Helen. But the point is, you can imagine that the technology augments and then uh, you have a pretty good shot. If you do that, I think we have a much, much better shot at keep. I don't know of a model that I have seen that doesn't have contact tracing as a relatively substantial part that predicts that we have a shot of staying open uh, through the rest of 2020. So it's an issue of how badly do we want to stay open? Yeah. And I think for our last question, we have so many in the chat box, but you've answered a lot of them. I want to turn to uh, Greg Martin uh, from Society of Critical Care Medicine. Dr. Martin. Hi, Ashish. This is really a wonderful talk and thanks for the discussion. My question is similarly, it's, it's about testing and particularly about given the long asymptomatic phase of the disease and essentially the daily risk of contracting the question is, who do we test and how often? Are we testing asymptomatic people or all people uh, or only symptomatic people? And particularly for medical meetings or colleges or other things, do we test every day? Are we testing the workers before they come? How do we ensure that those things can all happen? Greg, I want you to help me answer these questions. <laughs> the, these are the most important questions. Uh, and I have, um, I've been spending enormous amounts of time uh, talking to, basically talking to anybody who's willing to talk to me about this, um, methodologists, uh, people who, who, you know, epidemiologists, infectious disease experts. I, I, so the short answer is I don't know. But let me give you a bit of what I have been thinking and what I've been uh, learning. So obviously, testing asymptomatic people who are shedding virus and, and are infectious is incredibly hard because that literally means testing every American. And if you, and even in the models that Paul Romer and others have done of like 30 million tests a day, um, you'll just miss a whole bunch of folks. And so it's, it's and to itself, it's not, gonna, it's not gonna work. So the way I have been thinking about this, and again, please like tell me uh, how to do it better, is our strategy has to be like a two or three prong strategy. One is begin with symptom, symptomatic people, including people with really mild symptoms because a chunk of folks are spreading virus in their pre-symptomatic period. So find somebody with a symptom, test them. If they're positive, look in the previous three days at everybody they've been in touch with, and you'll pick up a bunch of the people they've spread the virus to. And then get, get you through the asymptomatic issue. On the asymptomatic, focus on places that are high risk where super spreading could happen. And super spreading has been, and this is, a, this is an important, thing, I made this mistake. I used to think of super spreading as a people phenomenon. Like there are people who, who are super spreaders. 
And I have over time realized that's the wrong way to think about it. There are places that create super spreading. And what are those places? Nursing homes, meatpacking plants, prisons, enclosed spaces where large numbers of people hang out. There, take a very aggressive testing strategy of asymptomatic people. How often? I don't know. Like, it depends a bit on how often you can do it. If you could test everybody in a nursing home once a week, including all the workers and all the, uh, and then every visitor who comes in, that'd be great. Should you do it more than once a week? Is that going to be enough? I think it'll help a lot. may not be perfect, but it's going to get us close. Um, Meatpacking plants, sort of a similar thing. And you're going to miss a few, but you'll do much, much better overall. So that has been the kind of strategy that I've been advocating. Start with symptoms and do aggressive test, uh, uh, testing uh, and isolation, and then have a bunch of places where you're looking for asymptomatic because the risk of missing it is so high. And then if you still have a bunch of tests left over, then let's talk about where else you could go looking. Uh, but I think that gets you like 80, 90% of the way there. And you can feel like my lack of sureness is not sure. You got a thumbs oh, by the way, healthcare up. system too, doctors, nurses, surveillance of them and people who come into the hospital. Like, how could I forget that? But that's another really important group. All right. Thank you so much, Ajish. You have, uh, you have filled this time beautifully. We have many more questions, but we'll uh, see if we can get some of them answered after the fact. But just uh, maybe in the last minute or two, can you give us your sense of how you think 45 specialty societies can be most helpful. Yeah. Um, and also keeping in mind the chat you and I had the other day about also the fact that a lot of these societies have state chapters where you believe a lot of the locus of control is going to be next. Yeah. So I'm going to, uh, I, I, here's my, thank you, Helen. And I, I had meant to bring this up earlier. Um, I think this uh, pandemic is going to end up ultimately, ultimately being a 50 state response. Um, what I'm hearing from most health leaders, I'm sorry, most political leaders is I think people have now given up that there will be a coordinated federal response and that the federal government will play a substantive meaningful role. I, I, I think uh, if it turns out that at some point the federal government changes its interest in doing that and starts being helpful, that'd be great. Uh, but I think at this point, people are assuming that the federal government uh, they're not going to help on testing. Um, yes, yes, I do. Somebody, I, do. I've got a, I just have a quick break now, and then i got to get on again. All right. I'm going to keep talking over that person. Uh, so um, basically, what I uh, um, think is going to happen is that every state is going to kind of go this on their own. And then we're creating these regional collaboratives, right? The New England and Midwest and out west. And I think all the policy actions at the state and therefore, and by the way, states are not equipped to do this. They usually turn to the CDC. They usually turn to the feds for technical expertise. And so I think we all on this call have an enormously important role in shaping those policies because the states don't have a ton of expertise. And if we can, as physicians, as clinical leaders, as specialty society leaders, work with our state representatives, um, the Department of Health, the governor's office, other folks, we can shape those policies to be much more science and evidence-based. And so I actually think there's no other group that is better poised to influence how America deals with this. And my general feeling is trying to influence federal policy is fine, but I don't think that's where the action is going to be. Um, I think the action is going to all be in the states. It's not the, my preferred approach to, to fighting a pandemic, but I think it is the approach that we are going to be living with. And so please continue doing the federal stuff, um, but put a lot of time, energy, and attention into local state uh, responses, because that's what's going to make the difference. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Ashish. That was fabulous. It was amazing you. how you were answering questions as people were typing. Uh, so I think you, you got most of it answered, and we'll... Uh, We'll take it from there. So thank you, thank you, thank you again for My taking pleasure. time. We look forward to seeing you on our TVs soon again, I'm sure this afternoon. Um, so again, thank you to all. So we're gonna have a brief break uh, for the next, uh, if we're, we're gonna begin our uh, professional peer groups and the CEO council in 15 minutes at 9.15. Thanks everybody. Thanks again, Ashish. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.